Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I'm so glad you're with us this week. We have an amazing guest coming on this week to talk all about her success on Amazon and all the different changes that she's made in business. But first, I have a quick announcement for you. Quick reminder that this week, in the next few days, is the Q4 Jumpstart class. If you have not been through a Q4, if you want to know what to sell, where to get it, how to get it, when to ship it in, and how to kill Q4 this year and make bank, you need to go to mommyincome.com slash jumpstart. You only have a few more days to register before the live class and before the price goes up after that. So you want to make sure you go to mommyincome.com slash jumpstart to register for that. I'm telling you, it's amazing class. We've done it every year for about four years now, and you're going to learn amazing tips about what to send into Q4, um, what sells, what's going on all the way from August I know August is pre-Q4, but we still send Halloween in in August. Yes, we do. And so all the way to December. So you want to make sure that you sign up for that. And without further ado, let's get to our guest today. Her name is Lori Tomanto. I love her last name. It's just so funny. I just want to say tomato, tomato. You know, I'm sure she gets it all the time. Um, she is such a business savvy lady. We met the, for the very first time at one of the Confident Wholesale Bundlers workshops and she's as smart as can be and she's had so much success with business, not just with Amazon, but with other things. And so without further ado, Lori, welcome to the show. Hello, how are you? I am fabulous. It's good to see you again, finally, it's been you. a while. I have to say that's the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> Absolutely the best. It's all the truth. It's all the truth. I know you and I have had many conversations <laughs> since the first time that we met and, you know, bonded over football, of course, at first, and then talked about other things. But um, I just want to say thank you for coming to the show. I know I want to get right to it because you have so much business experience and so many things to share with everyone. And you know what? The audience has really been asking for some more success stories about, you know, not just, um, Amazon, but bundling and different things. And your story just paints such a great picture of all the different changes people go through when they do businesses. And so why don't you start a little bit at the beginning? What was the first business that you ever really embarked on? So, well, I've really been kind of running businesses, whether it was for myself or for someone else since I was 16. I started out in the restaurant business. I was in that for about five years. And then I was in the litigation copy business when that kind of took off um, in the late 80s and early 90s. And in, towards the end of that, the last six years of that business, I had my own copy service, uh, where basically I was doing wholesale copying. I was taking overflow from other copy services, most of which were people that I worked for or worked with at some point in time. And so I did a wholesale uh, model for six years and enjoyed it. Um, but, you know, as most people have realized, you know, everything's going digital and, um, you know, the paper was kind of going away and it was, I, I saw what, um, what was the tipping point coming to the business and industry. And instead of trying to find a way to continue to do that, I just decided to sell off my assets and get out of that business and go and get a job. So I did that when I was 35. And I spent about eight months, uh, my full-time job was looking for a full-time job. <laughs> um, and so that was a little, um, a little bit depressing. Um, then I finally landed a job, uh, the, the current job that I have now, working for a law firm. And uh, I got that job, or got in the door at that job through my connections in the business and have been there since. And uh, about six years ago, we had cutbacks as many businesses will have cutbacks. And with those cutbacks, my hours were cut. So of course my pay was cut a little bit. And I didn't really want to go and get a job where I was punching another clock somewhere. And so I started looking at some different opportunities that were out there. And, and I kind of dipped my toe into something that was an MLM business. Um, and again, was reminded that that is just really not the model for me. Um, some people do very well at it. I'm not one of those people. And uh, so in the process of that, I started doing flea markets. And so for the last six years, I've been Wait, doing- I gotta stop here right there. 
Okay. Gotta stop you right there, right? Because I'm like a flea market junkie. Okay, I'm not even gonna lie. I'm a flea market junkie. How does one get it? You just glossed over that so quickly. Like I just got into the flea market business. Okay, so how did that come about? Let's talk about that. For okay. a so again, I didn't want to punch another time clock, um, and I wanted something that was flexible. And so, uh, like I said, I was doing this MLM thing. And I was like, well, where could I go and talk to a bunch of people about these wonderful products that I have for them? And there's a very large flea market about an hour east of Dallas. I live in the Dallas area. And um, they can get, during certain months, they can get up in the upwards of 100,000 people that go to this flea market over the four-day weekend. And I'd had friends that had done it before uh, that were crafting people and things like that. And so I thought, well, let me take a shot at this place and learn really quick. Nobody wants to stop and talk to you about your wonderful products. They want to see it. They want to touch it. They want to buy it. They don't want to order it. So from there, I started migrating over into retail products. And I had a lot of people that were around me that basically kind of took me under their wing. They saw that I was really trying to do something and learn the business. And people were willing to teach me. And so um, I did the flea market business. Actually, June was my last month to do it. Um, because three years ago, one of my mentors and friends that I made out there um, at that flea market um, is does Amazon as well. And I had sold, you know, when I went back to school years ago, I had bought and sold books on Amazon. That was before it was what it is today. It, that was when it truly still was just a, a book business. Uh, it had a few other items, but it was predominantly books. And so I was familiar and I already had a, an account because I had been buying and selling my school books on there. Um, but I was like, so how are you making money on this Amazon thing? And what's this you can send stuff in and you don't have to ship it? And it's not like eBay? Uh, tell me more about this. And so, you know, he, they would always kind of give me little snippets here and there, but they weren't really ever telling me the real deal. You know, what the ins and outs. And I was like, well, why is that? Well, once I kind of started researching it and I took a class on it, I was like, oh, that's why. Because there's just too much information. You can't just have a five minute conversation with someone about how to do Amazon. Really? I hadn't noticed. No. That's the reason there's so many courses and classes and videos and this exactly. podcast because y'all, you can't just learn how to, how to sell on Amazon with a conversation with someone at a flea market. You've got to really know what you're no. doing. And you can't really have, you can't even have a conversation over a lunch. You can have an introduction, you can have a preliminary talk about it, but to learn to do Amazon is more than a conversation or two. And so I found the course, um, it was with a company that I don't think is around anymore. The information was good, but the other things they were trying to upsell you on, not so good. And fortunately, I did not go into that with them. Uh, I, I learned how to do it myself. And then, you know, I started digging around and that's when I started finding, oh, I could have gotten a lot of this information for free <laughs> on, on YouTube. And so uh, I started going through different YouTube videos, just doing, you know, broad searches and found a bunch of different people. Uh, mommy income obviously being one of the ones that I found um, there was others uh, the green room you know those guys are pretty good the diff the thing was the first year and a half or so that I was doing Amazon I was kind of like ricochet rabbit mm -hmm. I mean I was all over the place uh, bing, when, you bing, say, bing. when you say all over the place what define that when, when you're talking so, about the place you mean there's like so many models okay Models. There's so many different models to do, and I was trying to figure out how to do them all. Um, so my recommendation to anybody getting started is, there's nothing wrong with that, but understand you're probably not going to get really good at one thing, because you're trying to do too many. 
jack of all trades, master of none. That's why there's a exactly. saying for that because, you know, I hear a lot of this a lot. You know, people will come and say, well, what should I do? Should I go into private label? Should I do merch? Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I sell books? Should I, you know, all these different things. And, and the answer is always yes, eventually, I guess, yes. but you have to start somewhere, right? You have to start with something. So what was the sourcing method? What is the model you finally decided? I'm going to try this and give this a shot first. So I was, because I was doing the flea markets, I already had some wholesale accounts um, locally that I was already doing business with. And so I started there kind of, you know, looking through what kind of products they had. Did any of those have a presence on Amazon? And so a few of them did. And so I started with that, but predominantly um, what I did in the beginning was retail arbitrage. Um, you know, three years ago, especially, um, Amazon was just really kind of starting as I found out when I got into this, they were just kind of starting to really clamp down on some things as far as brands wanting to protect themselves, um, as far as gating, ungating, restricting, unrestricting. And of course I was a new seller, so I didn't really have the rights to sell a lot of different things. And, you know, a lot of people I think get hung up on that. And, you know, my philosophy has always been, there's plenty of things to sell. Absolutely. Plenty I, of things I to sell. I can't echo that enough here. For those of you guys that might be new sellers, you're listening, you're watching, you're thinking, I want this kind of success, but I feel like I can't sell anything. Um, the reality is, is that you don't have to be, I mean, ungating, I will, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Being in as many categories as possible opens up way more opportunities for you to sell different products. But the reality is there's some people that only sell one category of products for eternity. Uh, auto parts, maybe they're not a parts store and they're just trying to move inventory. And so they move their products to Amazon and they have their brick and mortar. Great. They don't have to be everywhere to make a living. So start where you're at and move forward to ungating um, when it's time. And I think you'll know when when it's time when you start to build up, but don't try to be everywhere all the time and don't whine about the fact that you're not, you're ungated, you're gated in some of these things or restricted in some things. There is plenty of products to sell millions and millions and millions of products that are not in restricted categories. Home and kitchen is the strongest, most fastest growing category right now. I think that and, and clothing um, on Amazon and clothing is actually really easy to get into. Um, yeah. Yes, you need approval, but re regardless, it's a really easy niche to get into, but still home and kitchen unrestricted you can sell pretty much any product in those categories so no complaining allowed after this <laughs> well and and you know I, i'll give you an example <clears throat> i think a lot of people get hung up on um oh i gotta get into grocery i gotta get into grocery and <laughs> and uh you know what i did that too i went down that rabbit hole and guess what grocery margins are really not that good so you know, the thing is, the way I see it is, if you're learning along the way, there's nothing wrong with it, you know? And so, you know, retail arbitrage was something I think that was really good for me to learn a lot. I learned, oh my gosh, this rank is so incredible. I'm gonna buy this product and I'm gonna make 15 bucks on it or whatever. But by the time I processed it, shipped it in, you know, a hundred of my closest Amazon friends also found that wonderful bargain. And now the price is changing. Wah, and wah, so, wah. Yeah, exactly. that's the inevitable retail arbitrage price tanking. It happens to yes. everyone. It's the reason why we talk about getting into wholesale and specifically bundling because retail arbitrage, I 100% agree with you. It's a great way to get your feet wet, to understand the process, send stuff in. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost an arm and a leg. You don't have to place big wholesale orders. Although y'all know, we've already done a whole show about this. Wholesale is not expensive or hard to get into. That's a myth. It's, it, I have wholesalers. We actually have a list, mommyincome.com slash vendors, free list of places you can get $300 or less of vendors that will take you right now. Amazon selling less than $300. Some of them have zero minimum order. So no excuses with that either. Um, so that's why we do wholesale, right? And all that, because there's this price tanking issue that comes with retail arbitrage. Great way to get started just to learn, but then moving into a more legitimate business model um, moving forward. So how did you make that transition from the retail arbitrage then into um, using some of your wholesale accounts or, you know, what was next after when you realized that retail arbitrage was not going to be long-term for you? 
Well, <clears throat> I probably did that on and off for about two years or a year and a half. I did did mostly mm -hmm. retail arbitrage, um, and then again, you know, just the fact that it, it's very time consuming. So. You know, the thing that, because I had played around with some of the different models that Amazon offers, you know, I did merch. I realized, you know what, I really don't have the talents or the time to sit and design t-shirts all day and then advertise. But there's a lot of people that are very talented in that. And so, you know, I, I kind of spent two years really going through um, different models on Amazon and the more I learned about bundles and, and really what, what made that take off for me was going to the workshop. Um, I had played around with a few bundles. Um, I didn't really know how to do all the research as, as well as I do now, I think, as well as, you know, it's just experience and it's time and it's just, and you also kind of, I think when you, if you want to have success with bundles, you kind of have to pick a niche. You can't be all over the place like you would with retail arbitrage. You know, with retail arbitrage, you could be selling clothing, home decor, toys, you know, fishing supplies, mm -hmm. whatever. Whereas if you're trying to bundle and you're trying to be successful at it, my recommendation just from my experience is pick a niche or two and work that really well. Then once you get really good at that, and maybe move on to some and other niche. Why would you, why are you recommending that? I mean, why, well, you've noticed that you've done all over the place, maybe with different bundles and things like that, but what, why were, did you decide that I'm going to focus on this niche when it comes to um, bundling? Well, I think it, you're more familiar with what people are doing and, and what, what's triggering them to buy instead of, you know, you're not having to reinvent the wheel every time, um, you know, as an example, let's just say you're doing a home decor niche and, you know, you're doing, um, uh, or I'll say kitchen stuff because I've done kitchen stuff before. So you, you put together bundles of um, oven mitts with the pot holders and the, and the towels and the this and the that. Well, after you've done it a few times, one, it makes it easier to make your listing because you know what the keywords are. Exactly. So you're saving time. Um, and so you know what keywords are hitting. And then you just maybe you're changing colors, you're changing brands, you're changing things like that. That's easy. So it makes your listing creation easier. You've probably already played around with a bunch of different ways you've done photographs. And you figured out which ones kind of trigger people to buy. Um, whereas if you're doing a kitchen one and then uh, children's clothes or children's toys or whatever, you're having to do research all over again. Exactly. And you're having to find keywords and phrases and you're having to do, uh, you're having to figure out what niche people are going for. Well, and the thing about that, and you know, you know, because of the bundle class and everything else, we we teach this for a reason. It's because you know you stay. You, it's longevity. There's a, there's a lot of different things that will help people to continually have success, even if you've only had one bundle. If you have no bundles, is it if you're if you're doing the research? And you know what? Guess what? The reality is, you're gonna have some that are a flop that are gonna fail. I do it mm -hmm. still. You know, where you think and all the keywords are lining up and everything's fantastic and everything's great and for some reason, you know, the, the algorithm goes wrong and there's nothing you can do to rescue it. It just wasn't what you expected. And that's just going to happen in any business. Hence the reason why stores have clearance sections, because not everything is, is the sunshines and rainbows that you expected it to be. The reality is though, Lori's absolutely right. And of course she's learned this and practiced it and done it just probably as many uh -huh. times as I have, is that you do the research once for something, you realize it's working out okay, even if it's just okay and say, okay, what can I do to repeat this? What can I do to put this? And nothing's ever going to be on autopilot. You will never hear me say that this business is on autopilot because there's no such thing. So if someone's yeah. telling you, you can set it and forget it. They're lying to you and run away as fast as you can. But this is real work, but it doesn't have to be that hard. Once you do one, you start doing a bundle and you realize what's working, what's not, and then change variety, change style, change, it, change the different attributes of it, make variations instead of mm -hmm. going back again, like Lori just said, if you're selling baby 
baby stuff and then you're switching over to grocery and you're switching over to kitchen. You're just starting all over with your framework process over and over and over again. And who yep. wants to do that all day long? I mean, not me. <laughs> well, and the thing is, is that it, depending on the niche that you pick and what you're doing, um, like I said, I'll go back to the kitchen thing. And you, you did a, um, you did a, a video recently, you know, where you had gone to the dollar store. And so, you know, if you already are selling, you know, say the oven mitt with the, with the towels and the this and the that, well, what else could you put with that? What else are people buying when they buy that? And so you can- It's called them. bundle with your bundle. Have you guys exactly done this? Exactly. So this is like it's genius level bundling right here. You create a bundle. How many of you guys have do this? Email me, text me, send me a pigeon, carrier pigeon if you have to. I want to hear from <laughs> audience members listening right now of- have you bundled an item? Have you looked at your own bundle and looked at frequently bought togethers with your bundle? Here's why we, we created this word during a workshop. I think the last few times we had a workshop is um, deluxify. And it's not really a real word probably, but how can you deluxify something that's already working? So Lori gives this example of oven mitts and kitchen towels. It's all matchy matchy and great. Someone buys that, but what else are they buying along with it? And there's a way to deluxify the bundle. Exactly. Exactly. So now yeah, they, might, they might want, someone might want spatulas and spoons with the same color. You know, I don't know about those you, kinds but I know of things happen people, all the time. That with so, their decor, they go crazy with everything has to be matchy matchy. I know a lady that's got roosters in her kitchen and everything is rooster. So if she sees anything that goes in the kitchen that has a rooster on it, she's buying it. There are people out there like that. And remember, you don't have to please everybody. You don't have to sell a thousand units a month of your bundle in order to make real good money. You have to please a handful of people looking for niche products. That's right. Well, and, and everything, all the decisions that I make come down to two things, time, money, where, and, and, and we've talked about this before, it's like a seesaw, you know, when you first get started in business, you typically have more time than money, so you're willing to do certain things up here because you don't have as much down here, but as soon as you start to, to have your seesaw go the other way, you have to change your thinking. You have to change the way you're looking at things and how you're conducting your business. And when you have less time, you don't have time to run around to 20 stores looking for those clearance items to send in one-offs. You can do it. You can make some money. Well, and honestly, I've, I've had this question a lot. And actually recently I talked to a lady that heavily promotes um, retail arbitrage and things like that. And look, you guys, I'm not a hater of retail arbitrage, but my experience has been, you know, and I've been in the Amazon game since 2008. So I consider myself a long-term veteran after you've had uh, 10 years into, into a specific business, you're kind of a veteran at knowing what, what's going on with that. I've done retail arbitrage. Uh, retail ar arbitrage paved the way for where my business is right now. However, with the risks of copyright infringement, with the risks of Amazon cracking down on all kinds of branding and all different things like that, and the fact that just like Lori said, you're building yourself a prison because once you get involved in the retail arbitrage game, even if you love it, guys, I loved it. I love to go out and treasure hunt and look for the deals and say, oh my gosh, I can sell this on Amazon for 50 bucks and it's only $10 here. I mean, that was always like what got me to keep going back. But then after, after was building an actual business and it wasn't just a little side hustle hobby thing, um, I wanted to make real money. And I realized that it was hours and hours of scanning and hauling and bringing stuff in and bringing stuff out and only for one-off products to where now people like Lori, people like me, we create bundles that we can just go repeat. Um, send in order, replenish, and not have to go back out to stores, find all brand new inventory week after week. I mean, think about the insaneness of that. Would you ever see even your mom and pop brick and mortar stores and the lady goes out and be like, oh, I got to go shop for my inventory today. I guess I'm going down to Walmart. I mean, this doesn't actually happen in real business. I mean, retail arbitrage is real and it's fine. And there's always going to be retail arbitrage. There's always going to be a hole in the marketplace, buy low, sell high. That's just retail in general. But if you're trying to build long-term sustainable business model, retail arbitrage will build you a prison faster than it will build you a long-term business. So just 
hear that now and get out of it as soon as you can. So you did retail arbitrage, you started doing bundling. What, give us some pros and cons in your opinion, your experience, pros and cons of bundling. So the cons, uh, I'll start with cons. Yep. So to me, a con of bundling is if you make some of the same mistakes that I made, especially in the beginning, which is to not make your bundle very hard to replicate because there are people out there teaching people to find people like me that don't make bundles hard for you to replicate and to copy it and to get on the listing. I can't tell you last year, and these were bundles that I had created before I was in the workshop. Um, and there was a couple I created because I was like, ah, let me test the waters on this. And then it took off and I was like, oh crap, that's okay, that's good. Um, and then, you know, 20 of my closest Amazon seller friends found it and destroyed it. You know, something that I was making about $6 a, a bundle on, um, suddenly I was making a dollar. And you know what? I'm going to work just as hard for $6 as I am for a dollar. So I'm not going to continue with a dollar profit. It's not worth my time. Um, so I basically, I took what I had created and I tweaked it and made it more difficult for somebody to copy. And then... I'm selling it now. Can so I ask you what you did with that? Did you create your own product to put it in or was it packaging or was it just like mixed vendors? I didn't make it so easy to find one of the pieces. I didn't name the, the brand. So someone could still copy it, but they're going to have to try and find it. They're going to have to try and figure out the exact one that I got what store I got it from. Because actually that is the retail, that, that particular bundle is a retail arbitrage bundle I put together, kind of like your dollar store thing, where I, I buy products. Because basically there was a big retail box store that I had one of the department managers was ordering for me. So that way I didn't have to run all over the place. Exactly. You know, that's a great tip too. Like I ended up doing that when I was doing grocery bundles back in the day is that I was running around from store to store. I had like a hot seller, couldn't get enough products. So I finally reached out to the manager. I'm like, can you order this by the case for me like weekly? <laughs> because I tried to get it wholesale and they're like, you have to order 3000 pounds a week yes. and delivered. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a joke. Right. Um, and right. so literally I couldn't. So getting to store managers and ordering it for you. So, so you did that first. And so those those are, that's a con. I think one of my particular cons, what is uh, discontinued items? That like, was going to be my, that was my second con. Uh, so what is, is your nightmare? Is when you have, when you have one piece that goes away, um, that's, that's what stinks. Mm -hmm. So, it's you know, and it happens. And in fact, the, the bundle that I'm talking about, the one where everyone jumped on, um, that, that bundle is dead now. And the reason it is, is because that particular brand redid the towels. So mm. the towels that I had in there are no longer available. Yeah. They changed the design, um, of that brand's towel. And so they don't even offer them anymore, but that's okay because I'm going to recreate with my harder to replicate. But well, and that's, me, that's, that's the, the good biggest. part about it is that every, and everybody needs to know this and just put it out there. Discontinued items are a very real thing for wholesalers and bundlers together because, you know, that people come out with catalogs and that they, they are testing products as well. And if they're not getting enough revenue from a particular product they release, they'll discontinue it. They don't care about you. They don't care about anything else. So you have to be aware every product, every bundle is going to have a life cycle. I mean, the reality is it's just a lifestyle. Look at the iPhone life cycle. It's what, like a year now? And then they come out with Not the next, even. next bells and whistles and then they change the ports and now you got to buy all new cords and I got to buy all this. You got I mean, that, that they're smart, right? They're, they know that if they keep making the same thing over and over again, they're not going to make any more money. So they reinvent the wheel so that we don't have to and we can do that. So just keeping that in mind, that's a common, you know, that, that's where you see stores and you see seasons changing and what's popular this year is not going to be. So the, generally speaking, I would say that uh, the life cycle of a product or bundle or both is about two 
few years. Sometimes you get a little bit longer, sometimes you get a little bit less, but just plan on that in your head so that you're constantly thinking about what else you're going to sell. Because if you think you're going to set it and forget it and just make millions and retire to the beach with one product, someone's <laughs> lying to you because that ain't happening. Yep. Well, and actually kind of on that same vein or uh, the company you're dealing with is going out of business, which is something I'm dealing with right now. And so my three top bundles um, will no longer be available as far as product to purchase. So part of my decision also with shutting down my flea market business was one, that's a totally different story that we can talk about, but the, that business is just kind of, it's tapering off. And the pandemic, I think, is going to really change things. Um, I do. I definitely it, want to touch on, because that was like, yeah. that's kind of like the climax of your story right now. That's yeah. what I love so, so much about what so, you have. Yeah. So the part of, um, when, I, when I decided to liquidate that part of my business, part of the reason was, too, I was maintaining two different inventories. I had one inventory for the flea market and one for Amazon and two businesses, basically, that I was running and taking a lot of time. And one just wasn't making money for me anymore. So talk so, about the flea market for a second. So talk about, I, I call it the beginning of the end, because I, you know, obviously know you better and know a little bit more of the story. So share with the audience, like what, what was the beginning of the end when it came to the flea market? Because I know it's been almost a year that you've been wanting to get out of the flea market uh -huh. business. You've just decided, you know, there was this tipping point where you're doing flea market, then you started Amazon and now you're kind of running both. And then what, what made you decide that the flea market had to go and Amazon had to stay? Um, the time money scale. Um, I was spending a lot of time doing the flea market business because even though it was a once a month market for four days, it was two weeks out of my month between prepping for it, shopping for it, doing it, and then getting my life back in order the week after um, with stuff around the house. And the money, people just weren't spending the money anymore like, like they used to. And uh, it, the profit wasn't there anymore. And so there was a space that I gambled on. Uh, it was a bigger space. Um, I was able to have a lot more inventory. I was closer to the food court area where there was a lot of traffic. And so I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm putting, I don't, I'm, I'm betting it all now. I'm betting it all now. And I did it last summer um, in, to, to capture what was the fall season, the Q4 shopping out there. So the Q4 shopping came and there were a lot of people, but they were not spending like they used to. And I was basically, I basically did the same amount in revenue as I did the year before with half the inventory and half the space. And I was like, at that point, I was like, yeah, Amazon's making money. This isn't making money. And Amazon's a lot less time. Um, speaking of the bundles, because it was last year in January was when I went to the Atlanta workshop. And so uh, six months later, I expanded the store. A few months after, Q4 hits. I'm making money in Q4 on Amazon with minimal work, really. And I'm killing myself with the flea market and I'm not making any money. And so I was like, you know, it doesn't take a genius, really, um, to figure out that that just wasn't working anymore. And so I did a few things to try and see if I could write the ship by trying to be kind of a, a niche store out there by doing buy one, get one half off. And I was like, well, I'll do this for one or two reasons. I'll have one or two things will happen. Either one, I'll start reducing my inventory to get out. Or two, I'll become the buy one, get one half off store. And so um, the latter didn't work. I mean, I was made, so I was making even less money, <laughs> but right. I was getting rid of inventory. Now I know, like, let talk about that for a second. Okay, so here's the question. Um, you still hung on to it maybe a little bit longer than you thought. Did you have like, 
issues with like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm failing if I just shut the store, I quit it? Or is it just, was it an easier decision than that of just being like, hey, this is not making money, I'm out of here. I mean, some of us are more emotional than others. I'd be like, I'm hanging on till the end. I'm one of those hanger honors where I just like, I feel like I'm going to be a quitter if I give up. But the reality is it's not quitting. In my opinion, it's not quitting. It's just a pivot. You say, this is working. This is not working. We're changing directions. We're not just hanging on for the sake of hanging on. I mean, that, that would be me. I mean, how, how, how do you feel about all that? Well, I think I did hang on longer than I should have, um, for emotional reasons. Um, I have a lot of friends out there. Um, I had some really good mentors, uh, that I had made over the years of doing it. And it was kind of like a family, you know, there was a, a group of us that, um, I've known them for six years, you know, it, it's almost kind of like, probably the best way to describe it is, you know, like people that are in the military, you know, unless you're in the military and you, and you go overseas and, and fight on the front lines with someone, you really don't understand what their relationship is because you haven't been in the trenches with them. And so I was with these people for six years through the good, the bad, the ugly, and the really, you know, the really awesome times. And so I kind of compare the flea market business is really kind of, I compare it to what a drug addict would go through. And, and, and this is how I mean. So like, you know, if someone does drugs, just as an example, and they go, oh, wow, this is just awesome. They spend the rest of their time trying to chase that same feeling. And that's kind of the same with the flea market business and is, you know, when I started doing it, you had eight months a year that were really good and then four months that weren't so good. So you weathered the four months to get that, that rush of excitement of selling a lot of stuff uh, in those good months. Well, then, you know, then the eight months turned into six months, turned into five months, turned into four months. And so as it just kept declining, I was like, mm, you know, it, I didn't see where there was going to be an uptick. And so that's when I finally had to come to the realization that as much as I enjoyed the camaraderie with the people that I had gotten to know out there, plus the customers, you know, I had a lot of fun with the customers. Um, I'm a pretty outgoing person. Uh, you know this, uh, maybe not everybody else does, but I, I can t- start a conversation with anybody. Absolutely. Well, here's the good news. Now that you've liquidated, so I mean, I'll, I'll, I can let you, you know, tell that part of the story if you want to, but fast forward to now with pandemic, with your decision already being made that it's just going down, down, down. And with all the pandemic and things being shut down, you decided I'm closing my my flea market and I'm going to liquidate. The great news is that now that you've done that and you're you're completely out of the flea market business, you can go back as a guest and just shoot the shit with all of your old friends, but you don't have the pressure of making money and selling and all that. So now you're free to do what you want with your time, including going to the flea market just to hang out with your buddies. So I think that's a better deal for you. You're making more money and you can still hang out with your friends and and talk with them. So the decision to liquidate, talk about that for a second and, and, um, how freeing, I know it was freeing for you. You had this moment of like, Oh my gosh, I'm, Oh my gosh. Well, I'm, I'm a bit OCD. And so I, I do get just, I, I've been going through this just incredible purge. I mean, I love accomplishing things. Um, and so when I was getting rid of stuff, And I was just like, there was a certain mentality that there's a certain mentality you have to get that it's like, you know what, this got to go. You know, I, if, if I can get most of my money back, great. Um, and, and I can honestly say that for, for me, the pandemic was a godsend for me for what I wanted to do, which was liquidate this business. Um, because during the time that I decided to do that, I I made the decision in March and the flea market was closed for April and May. So I had two months free to just unload. And I found a group on Facebook that was wholesalers buying and selling. And at first when I was posting stuff in there in March, I wasn't really getting too many bites and not too many hits. April comes along 
more places have been closed for a while. People are still wanting to buy things. They can't get product. And so I found the right mix. Uh, you know, I had played around with what triggers people to buy on this group. And, you know, offering a flat rate price that included the shipping, where it was just, you know what you're paying. And I'm that kind of buyer too. I like to just, you know, if I know exactly what it's cost me and I can figure out, you know, what my cost per unit is, I'm more likely to make a decision than, oh, hey, can you let me know what the shipping is? And so- a question for you. What, I bet a lot of people are thinking this is like, okay, you had all this flea market stuff and like, I don't know, everybody's from different parts of the world. In my neck of the woods, most of the flea markets are literally like, um, used stuff, antique stuff, collectible stuff, not a whole lot of brand new type things. Like there's a few shops like that where you can tell people are selling brand new kind of things, but most of it's like people like you're basically like your garage sale. Everybody's bringing their garage sale right to the flea market right. grounds and everybody all that. So you had, you were buying from wholesalers at that point. My mm -hmm. question is, and I know everybody, the burning question wants to know, why didn't you liquidate your flea market stuff on Amazon? And I'm guessing it's because it wasn't profitable. Is that it? Exactly. Like I mentioned before, I was running two completely different kinds of businesses with two different inventories. Things that sell at the flea market doesn't necessarily sell at, on Amazon. Um, a lot of the things that I sold at the flea market um, were, all, were new items. Um, and the one that I was, the, the market that I was selling at has anything from your garage sale stuff all the way up to, you know, people are selling $5,000 mantles and $10,000 pieces of furniture. So mm -hmm. it went that whole spread. So uh, it, it, it's over a hundred acres of shops and flea markets and buildings. And so I had kind of, I had a store where I sold all new items. And so, um, some of the item, most of the items did not translate to Amazon. Um, they didn't have a presence there and it wasn't worth my time to create a listing to sell two or three items that I might've had in stock. Um, there was also just no demand for some of the items on Amazon that I was selling out there. Uh, what I could sell on Amazon, I did. Um, and actually, you know, it was like every week, I was going out there because I had a lock and leave store. And so I would drive out there and pick up stuff. And every time I went, I would scan a couple of things and go, okay, let me see if this is on Amazon now. Um, and so that's really, it was the wholesale group that I found is how I got rid of most of it. And I got back, I would say I, I got back between 80 and 90% of my capital. That is great. Which is and not so bad. now you've liquidated. That was just a, a month or so ago. You're you're totally done with that. And now you've got this capital. You you know divorced your inventory that you knew wasn't going to do well. You liquidated, and now you have this good chunk of change that now you can reinvest into something that's working on Amazon. Hence bundles. So a little bit of a personal question here: Have you been preparing for Q4? I mean, Q4 is right around the corner, um, and now you've got this influx of inventory cash. Um, what are you doing with it? Well, right now, um, I'm basically buying out this business that's going out of business. I am, I am stocking up uh, on all the supplies that I put together in bundles um, so that I have at least enough for probably a year to year and a half. So that's part of it. Um, the second part is, actually, I'm taking a break. Um, <laughs> I can't say enough how much I love that answer. Instead of working your butt off and keep working, keep moving, you're giving yourself. A, tell me you're going someplace extravagant or something something fun. What um, I'm looking on VRBO. I'm looking at September. I'm going to take a few days and take my dogs with me and rent a lake house and just go there and sit there. Yay. Fish, good for you. Get the sun, whatever. Um, so I'm not, right now, I'm not really in the creating um, and really what I'm, I'm, have come to the realization is right now, I, I needed a break because essentially for the last three years, I've been working three jobs. I had my job, I had the flea market, and then I had Amazon. And so I've been working from home since March, um, with my job and 
now that I'm not doing the flea market store this weekend, this is, I don't know when this will air, but it's July 4th weekend. I won't be at the flea market. I will be sitting by my pool enjoying my 4th of July. And how freeing is that to be able to decide for yourself? You know, this is what I love most about your story is that you are, you know, you, you know, you, you've come to terms with being able to make transitions and changes. Changes aren't easy. You guys, I don't care how long you've been doing something. I don't care how long Lori was doing a flea market. It's really, you have to have the mental stability to let something go, knowing it's no longer mm -hmm. serving you. And guess what? Our lifestyles, our, our personality, everything, things change over time. Who I am now is not who I was 10 years ago. It's not who I was five years ago. And that's awesome. And giving yourself permission to make a change in a transition because you've grown, you've changed, you've realized your time is worth more than the dollars you were trading at the flea market and all the work and all the, you know, going back and forth and all the things that went in that. And now you're like, huh. On July 4th, I'm not at the flea market. I get to do whatever the hell I want to do. And that's a great thing. And so I applaud you for that. Now, what, what kind of advice can you give? What has really helped you along the way to, for, to maybe anyone else who's nervous about making a big change? Maybe they're going to quit their job um, and do Amazon full time, or maybe they're going to transition out of Amazon, maybe like Amy did to where it's just like, this is no longer working for me. What is a big a piece of advice you can give to somebody that's kind of landing right in that space right now? Well, and I'll, I'll kind of start with touching on, you know, you had asked, did, did I hang on to the flea market, you know, because I was afraid of failing or whatever. I don't believe that when I transitioned out of that, that it was a failure. I think it was a success. I, uh, I, success, I successfully made a decision that that wasn't working. And I cashed in my chips. And, you know, you and I have had a personal conversation about this you know what, there, there's not too many businesses, and I've done it twice now, because I did it with my copy business when I made the decision to get out. Um, I walked away with money. You know, I know so many people that they'll make these decisions when they're at the bottom. They're about to file bankruptcy. Why? You know, it, it, don't hesitate. So that's one thing I will say. Don't hesitate to make a decision if you've done the research and if you know what's going on, if you're, if you're watching trends, and that's something too that I was, I was gonna bring up. So some people may go, oh, where do you learn things and this and that. So there's a couple of books that I would highly recommend and advise anybody right now to pick up and find. When I uh, finally got my full-time job years ago, I was like, I am not gonna get caught with my pants around my ankle again and not have my college degree. So I went back to school and I got a, a bachelor in sociology. One of my classes taught this book. Let's see if it'll come out. That's there we go. Point. It's called The Tipping Point. And it's by Malcolm Gladwell. If it, it, it is so insightful, and this book is 20 years old, but it's a very insightful book. It's a timeless book that right now is a great read for anybody whether for personal reasons or for business reasons. Another book that was very instrumental in my career early on when I was 22 is this one, The Seven Habits for Highly Successful People by Stephen Covey. I have a confession. I have never read that book. I know I probably should. It's just one of those that like when it first came out, it wasn't relevant to me and it probably is now, but I just haven't, haven't read that one. So I got to put it on the list. So these two books, I, I highly recommend anybody. Um, but when it, I would say advice for right now is I think that, especially with the pandemic going on, I think that this has been a great uh, take the foot off the accelerator and let's pump the brakes a little bit. And that's kind of what I'm doing with my time off is I'm going to reread these books because I haven't read them in years. Um, and I'm going to, I turned 50 in January and I'm like, you know, I really need to sit down and think about what do I want the next 10 years to be for me? Because I am getting closer to maybe making the next big decision in my life, which is retirement. So how am I going to get there? And one of the principles in this book is begin with the end in mind. 
Absolutely. You know, that's so important when you think about those things, because, you know, I, I love this and I can't say it enough that people need to take time to reflect. I'm speaking, you know, preaching to the choir here. I'm talking to myself because I'm getting ready to, yeah, we're recording, but right before 4th of July. So you all are listening to it, you know, a couple weeks from now, it's fine. But like, I'm getting ready to go on a, about a 12 day vacation. And I'm going to buy both of those books right now because I want to read paper books, not having a phone, not having anything on my vacation. That's one of the things I really do when I'm on vacation every year is I pick a couple of books and I read them and digest them when nothing else is clouding um, my, my vision and have that sort of a renewal type period. And I think it's really important that people do that. There's a really great episode on the Amazon files. It was December 30th, 2019, something around there about thinking about your past decade and your future decade uh -huh. and starting with what do you want the next 10 years to be that's a great episode if you guys missed it go back and listen to it um, i'm sorry i don't have episode number but the reality is that's what we need to do every uh -huh. year we need to give ourselves this time to decide what's working and what's not because honestly we're not getting any younger we might as well get happier along the way and what's going to make you happy is probably cutting a few things out of your life maybe it's a business you've hung on, on to too long and you want to just make a change in what's best for you don't apologize to anybody at any time for what's best for you because that is what you owe that's the only thing you can control and so what's best for Lori is no more flea markets, taking a uh -huh. vacation and going, you know, all out with, with bundles. So I love that you're giving yourself that time and you deserve it and you've earned it. And, you know, I, st I know you're still going to kill Q4 because it's going to be. Fabulous. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm now, not worried about that. Now that you uh, know that you're not so, in the flea market, right? You've got all this extra, a little bit of extra time. I, to I'm going to have extra time. I'm going to not, I'm not going to be using my uh, vacation time from my job to go do the flea market. So now when I, I can take not only time off, now if I wanna take time off to work, I'll be working on my Amazon business. You can come to Michigan and but, hang out with me, take some vacation. There you go. <laughs> so, an another piece of advice that I would give to somebody, and, and I've given this to people before, like I've had people over the years, well, how did you, how have you gotten here and how have you gotten there and this and that. And this is a, this is a philosophy I've had since I was in my early 20s is if you're looking around your peer group and you are the smartest one in the group, you need to find some more peers that are smarter than you, more successful than you, because that's how you grow. That's the only way you're going to grow. You're not going to grow hanging around the same people with the same philosophies and the same ideas. That's just not going to happen. That's and probably the best thing I've heard in a really long time. I mean, we all, we've all heard this before, right? If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? And I love that. And I want to end on that note because a lot of us have a lot of toxic people or like, like talking about changing. Um, you know, we're always growing and changing. And, you know, recently I ran into someone that I knew from way back in the day. Wow, you've changed a lot. And I said, thank you very much. I, I mean, that might sound like, a, and it sounded kind of negative, like, oh, you're not who you used to be. And I thought, thank God, if I was the same person I was, you know, 15 years ago when you met me, Lord have mercy. I need a lot of work. And so, you know, thinking about those things and don't be afraid to up your game. Don't be afraid to, I mean, I know COVID right now in quarantine, please obey all the rules and wherever they are in your state or nation or whatever. But you know, when we finally get let out of this COVID cage that we're in, um, meet with people, go to meetups, go to places where you can find higher level of success people. Pay the money to get a coaching call. Pay the money to talk yeah. to someone. You know what? The best 33 minutes of my whole life starting my Amazon career was when Chris Green gave me his personal phone number. Well, he gave it to the masses and said, give me a his book. I'm happy to help. And I was nervous as all hell, but then I was like, okay, I'm calling. And I've got my list of questions. And you know what? That changed everything. Uh -huh. Somebody that was where I wanted to be gave out their number and said, call. I would have paid for that call, but he did it for free. Great. I'm thankful for that. But pay the money, find a coach, find a mentor, get one up your game. If you want to be better than who you are right now, get with people that are better. Get with people that are smarter. That is just the best. I love that, Lori. Okay. So mentors are not that hard to find, you know, especially in business. You know, if it, like I said, I, I have a lot and I still do have a lot of mentors from my flea market business. A great place people to find someone like that is um, 
Oh, Sco, I think, is like a place where you can find, um, I, I'm, I'll put, the, put it in the show notes, a specific link for you guys, but it's basically retired CEOs, retired executives oh. that get, volunteer their time to coach um, people for free. Um, during, for It's an organization. I, I will put it in the link in the chat so that you guys all know right now it's escaping me. But the reality is there are people you can reach out to for free. There are people that you can reach out to on a, a weekly, monthly basis to just get yourself moving in the right direction. But let me say something too on that note is don't find a, don't go out and seek a mentor if you're wanting someone to tell you how to do everything all the time. That is not what a mentor does. Uh, a mentor is someone that you should be bouncing off of, bouncing ideas off of. Um, sometimes, you know, a lot of times a mentor will just offer information to you. If they offer you information, take it and do something with it. I think that that was part of the reason too that so many people did kind of take me under their wing when I started doing the flea markets because I didn't just come out there with this preconceived notion that I knew what I was doing. And I listened to what they advised me on and I put it into practice. Sometimes it didn't work for me because it, it, what works for somebody may not work for you, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. But you shouldn't go and, and find a coach or find a mentor if you're looking for someone to tell you what to do all the time, because that's not going to be a successful business model for you. Yeah. Your mentor is not there to make decisions for you. Your mentor is mm -hmm. there to give you a different perspective, to give you some, you know, maybe a couple actionable items that you can take action on, but the decisions ultimately are going to be yours. They can give their input and they can get their advice and you can, you know, use all of their experience to your advantage. That's the great thing about a coach or a mentor. But the reality is the decision out at the end is ultimately going to be yours. Well, Lori, I really, really appreciate you coming and spending this time being vulnerable vulnerable, telling the world your story. I appreciate that so much. And um, for those of you guys who want to connect more with Lori, she's in the Amazon Files Hub every single day. And she's, you know, top notch advice. If Lori says something, you better be listening because she's been there and done that. And she can give you some advice there. So if you want more information about that, mommyincome.com slash hub. That's our membership group. Lots of training, lots of great people in there. And again, Lori, thank you so much for your time. If you guys Thanks want to join the me. Facebook group, uh, the hashtag this week is Lori. So that is your mommyincome.com slash join us. You guys hear all the things. Everything's mommyincome.com something. This week it's join us, keyword Lori. And thank you again so much for coming to the Amazon Files. You guys don't forget Q4 Jumpstart starts next week. You got to make sure you're in it. Mommyincome.com slash jumpstart. We'll see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files. <laughs>